Well, it's an honor to be here uh, in front of all these distinguished folks. Uh, Rod Newcomb, I've known for a long, long time and always been a great, great mentor to everybody in the avalanche community around here. Uh, the title of my talk is something I've said for a long time, which is, if you can't be good, be lucky. And uh, obviously it's a little better if you can be good and lucky, but for this speech it's if you can't be good, be lucky. I'll start out and talk a little bit about uh, some of the th situations I've been lucky with, and then I'll talk a little about qualities I think avalanches work avalanche workers uh, need so they don't need to rely so much on luck. And then I'll finish with uh, backcountry skiers who seem to be relying on luck almost exclusively. <laughs> like many folks, I, uh, I came to Bozeman to go to MSU, ski and climb. Uh, my sophomore year, I, vol I volunteered for the ski patrol and uh, became interested in avalanches and started tagging along on AC when the pro patrol went up at Bridger. While going to school, I was lucky enough to get into Doc Montaigne's snow dynamics course and learned a lot about snow from Doc. Uh, mainly, I'm going to talk about the basic things I learned. And the most basic thing I can think of is the snowpack is always changing. It's always it's either getting weaker or stronger. It's not staying the same any time. It's always getting weaker and stronger. And what it, snow really doesn't like is fast change. So fast loading, fast warming, explosive skiers, all those things make it easy to trigger avalanches. After I graduated. I was able to get a job on, on the trail crew at Bridger Bowl to an AC in the morning and then uh, sawing trees and a variety of things in the afternoon uh, right after we opened the Pierre's Knob Lift for the first time. My partner at that time, you probably heard of, Bruce Tremper, who went on to a lot of greater things after that and now runs the Utah Avalanche Forecast Center. I stayed at Bridger with no real plan to do anything, but I ended up becoming ski school or uh, in charge of the ski patrol and then worked my way up to uh, general manager. But over the last 35 years, my favorite thing to do at Bridger continues to be avalanche control. I have one big advantage over the patrol. I work six days a week, so I usually see more AC days and I get to witness more change, a big plus for me. Now I'll talk about uh, three instances when I was lucky and what I learned. My first or second year, I was doing preseason eight avalanche control with Doug Richmond. The patrol director had loaned me a pair of rock skis because conditions so, were so bad he felt sorry and didn't want me to trash my skis. We, we triggered a couple good slides with explosives on B North, and then we got down to out of sight, threw a shot, and with no result. I slid out on the slope just above the crater to poke around and see what the snowpack looked like, and the, the, pack, the slide, slab broke about 15, 20 feet above me and started pushing me down the slope one ski rattled off, the next ski rattled off. It was real sugary light snow, very, very shallow, and I ended up in a hockey stop right at the edge of the cliff. The big thing I learned there, besides try and stay on your feet, which I've been really fortunate to do, I've never really been knocked down in all these years doing avalanche control. I've never, never been knocked down in a slide, which is really lucky. Um, is even the thing I learned was a well-placed charge does not always mean no avalanche. It's right after a well-placed charge, depth or really weak, fragile snowpack, it held up through the charge, but then came out. The skis were found the next spring, so you know he, he did get his skis back. 
couple years later, MSU engineering professors had a high-speed camera and wanted to get pictures of a big avalanche. Mark Sampson and I loaded our packs with explosives and debt cord and traversed north, or I'm sorry, south on the ridge to the boundary above the Slushman's Ravine with the plan to release one of the bus-sized cornices for the camera. Mark had me on belay as I approached the cornice. It was about, was at least a 20 feet back from the, the lip of the cornice. I poked my ski pole in about where we thought it would break to make a hole to, to set the first charge. The cornice broke in front of my ski boots. I had a great view of a huge avalanche and, and the bed surface about 15 feet down. The camera folks were just arriving at the PK gun mount and saw the powder cloud. The lesson learned here is it doesn't take much to drop a big cornice, even a huge cornice, if it's ready to go. On the way back from that, we were taking snowballs and we were flipping them like at the last table out there. It'd land on the end and they peel off. It was an amazing day for that. The last event is a wet slide event. It was the third day without freezing, which is a huge red flag for us at Bridger Bowl. And the patrol was going to close upper Bridger Lift to do some pushing and see how things were doing, whether we needed to close upper Bridger for the rest of the day or what was going on. I came up from the base area to help and was waiting at the top of the sluice box for everyone to get in position. As I stood on the, red or on the ridge crest right outside the penthouse, I stuck my pole in the pillow to see if I could still feel any crust. As I pulled my pole out of the snow, the basket dropped a little snowball on the pillow. It started rolling. It was a foot, then two foot, then three feet in diameter, tipped over, caused a small wet slab to come out to the ground. It slid down near the top of the old Deer Park lift. Those of you who know where that is. It was incredibly lucky that no one was caught and a huge mistake on my part. The lessons learned from that were obviously we can't call it that close and two, there can only be there can, there can be no distractions for the person in charge of keeping track of the snow change that day or any day when you have things going on. They need, and they need to make sure that everybody knows what the plan is. That's the end of my uh, uh, three, three things to be lucky with. I will mention also, though, if you're wondering, I've been skiing for... 53 years, and uh, I feel really, really lucky that I've never hurt myself, and I have all original parts. <laughs> um, I'll talk a little bit about the things a worker needs to, to keep from, from preventing too much on, on luck. Uh, first thing I think if you're doing AC is... is you need to be a strong skier and you need to be in good shape. And the main reason for that is so that you can really focus on what you're, you're doing and you're not worried about tipping over or being tired. You need to have a good eye for details. That's kind of obvious. You need to be really cluing into subtle little things that are going on. There's the snow's blowing the wind out of the trees in particular places or whatever's going on. Uh, you need to process information quickly and make decisions well before the situation is critical. And you can't hesitate to adjust the plan if conditions change. You need a good understanding of the snowpack and you need to have good avalanche control technique. And one of the things I think that, that we miss on a little bit is, is ski cut technique. Uh, we talk a lot about a lot of other things, but but knowing what to do if it's just loose dry snow or soft slab or small hard slabs, what, how big you can go and still deal with a hard slab, wet snow, how to push that and where you can be. And the worst thing I see from time to time is people 
getting out on the slope and they'll be jumping up and down on a, not sliding across it, but jumping up and down the middle of this slope. And if it really went, they're not really going where they want to go. It's a, you see it more than you, you'd hope to. If you need good uh, bomb preparation and placement, and you need to know where everybody is around you. If, you, if, you're, really, if you're really paying attention, and, and lots of times it's pretty chaotic when you're doing AC and there's lots of radio traffic, but if, you, if it's pretty easy and you understand what you need to do, it's, pretty, it's also easy to kind of keep track of everybody and know what's going on. You need to know the terrain and the history, and you need to understand that safe zones change with hazard. If you just go out there picking up new snow and it's just foof and you're not worried about anything breaking deep, there's a lot of safe places. If, if, if you're in a complete opposite situation where you think everything might go to the ground, then there's hardly any safe places and you really need to realize where that is and, and where you are with your people. Um, last couple things. And I think this is really important is you got to listen to your gut. If, if you have a bad feeling about whatever's happening, you got to speak up. Everybody doesn't want to be the one to say, I, yeah, I don't really like this. Or, but that's a really important thing to do because probably the guy next to you, you know, I was feeling the same way and we ought to do this instead. And this applies to almost any job you have is it's important that you like the job. You're going to be a lot better at it if you like the job than if you're just kind of going through the motions and putting in the time. So it's important to like the job and really focus on what you're doing. Um, the last group of folks is the folks relying on luck more than any, and that's the backcountry skiers adjacent to ski areas. In spite of uh, significant efforts by the Forecast Center and Bridger, there's an amazing disregard for avalanche danger just outside the ski area boundary. For many years, we had closed boundaries at Bridger, and, and uh, it was always sort of a cat and mouse game for the locals. Everybody would go out of bounds whenever we were looking the other direction or the cloud deck was low enough. And we knew it, and there, there weren't a huge number of them, and we were very lucky through those years that nobody was seriously injured close to us, just a couple on the backside. Um, then in 2004, we, we, uh, we put in low gates, and people received that pretty well, and, and most of the people that wanted to play by the rules used those gates, and, and we still had a large number of folks going out the, going out the top. And I realized then that it wouldn't, wasn't going to last long because one of the passes I pulled was actually a Bridger Bowl board member for going out the ridge up the top. <laughs> so in 2008, when we did uh, Slushman's Lift, we opened the ridge, or we had openings on the ridge for people to go out. And before we did that, we knew there'd be a lot of people. Uh, going out of bounds and, and, and using that terrain. And I thought that was, that was great. I kind of believe in freedom and, you know, you're free to go out there and learn, learn, make your own mistakes and figure things out. And it's just part of living in the United States, ho hopefully. But uh, I really thought that from the times I'd been up saddle before that people would look down from there and they'd go, you know, this is, this is real. There's, this is about as bad as it gets if you want to talk terrain traps and stuff not to be caught anywhere in if there's any sort of slide because that whole northeast aspect just shoots off a cliff. I mean, you're lucky if your transceiver survives, let alone you. So, but there's just this amazing disregard for that, and almost no matter what the ha the uh, the hazard rating by the avalanche center is, and. I can't really explain why we've been so lucky for five years. I mean, we've had really close calls. We, we had a huge, huge slide that could have easily buried five, 10, 15 people, but amazingly it was nothing. And we've had slides off the North Peak, we've had slides all around, and, and uh, we've just been really, really lucky. And 
I'm looking for anybody to tell me any way to make people more aware. A lot of the people out there are the people that wouldn't think of driving from here to the to East Main without buckling their safety belt. They put their kids in helmets, and yet they'll still drag their wives, girlfriends, whatever, up there, and and they'll bail off down it just because there's tracks. And uh, it's it's really kind of an amazing phenomena. Um, I'm hopeful that we'll stay lucky. Um, but I, I wouldn't bet anything on it, and I'm sure we're going to have a, a big uh, accident at some point. And with that, um, I'll open it to questions. All right. I, I have a comment. Uh, in my travels around the various ski areas in the late 70s and 80s, uh, I would often be the recipient from the ski patrollers about their problems with management. Uh, I have noticed that at those ski areas where the snow safety director came up to the patrol director and became a general manager, there were less of those complaints uh, about management. So I, I, Pass that on as a compliment to you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you.